Real Conversations is where we get the story behind the music of the leading new thought artists. This is Jeannie Kataoka. Join me and my host, Al Yankee, in the next episode of Real Conversations. Hi, I'm Jeannie Kataoka at, with my co-host, Al Yankee, and this is Hi. Real Conversations. And our guest today is Jamie Lula. I will say the fabulous Jamie Lula. Hey, Jamie, <laughs> how are you? I'm excellent. Thank you, Jeannie. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Hi, Al. Good morning. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jamie, and uh, then we'll go from there. It is the rare artist that is larger than the canvas they occupy. Their mission is bigger than the stage they stand on. Their commitment and contribution extend beyond themselves to encompass all who come in contact with them. Jamie Lula is just such an artist. Born and raised in Detroit's arts and musical hotbed, Jamie made his way to Southern California into the melting pot, the creative stew, where creativity, music, and transformation meet. Landing the gig at LA's Musicians Institute as a vocal professor, his explanations and leadership provided something unique for his students and his community a quiet and powerful sense of purpose, balance, and giftedness. Music is larger than just making sound. It is the heart of the spirit walk, the key to creative change in the world. Associating with the top thinkers in the nascent spiritual and human potential movement, Jamie's music influenced and was influenced by Michael Beckwith, Marianne Williamson, Neil Donald Walsh, Gene Houston, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Mary Manon Morrissey, Bishop Carlton Pearson, and so many more were endowed with Jamie's soundtrack, a music consistent with their larger purpose and message. Lending his voice and leadership in concert to youth groups and spiritual centers throughout the nation, Jamie has been honored by LA Music Awards, from which he received Best Male Vocalist, a winner of the Centers for Spiritual Living Youth Champion Award, and many other musical and mission-based honors. His work with youth is legend. With more than six albums to his name, it is a stroke of luck that we can enjoy and be ennobled by Jamie's spirit and sound. So let's not waste any time. Let's get right to Jamie's music. And the first one we're going to hear is Jamie's in the house. We're going to listen to Spirits in the House. Spirit in the house. Yeah, yeah. I said spirit. I done my time, I'm so tired, I give up on my simple mind, it's not working, I'm no good, I'm in need, if I only could find the spirit in the house, well yeah, the spirit. Just stop, I go through, pull me over, said the man in blue, son, you know what you done did. I said yes, I ran a lot of bread. What's your hurry while the race? Who you trying to keep pace with? Take your time now, it's alright. Got your answer, you can't hide from the spirit in the house. Well, yeah, spirit. Sing 
one of my favorites <laughs> but you'll probably hear me say that many times during this interview so what can you tell us about that one jamie oh thank you Jeannie. um spirit in the house uh it started up in barton flats and uh every year they would have a talent show and this one kid got up and he was just lip syncing so uh, a, a young African-American man, and uh, he lip-synced to a Kid Rock song, and he was just so into it. And at the end of it, I was standing next to um, um, Charles Hall, Reverend Charles Hall, and uh, Georgia and Stefan Muldrow, who are Ricky Byers' kids. Uh, I had driven them up to this camp, and I shouted out, Spirit in the house! So it kind of became my thing with the kids. Whenever a camp would open, before my first song, I would, Spirit in the house! So much of that, that early music of mine was inspired by the teens. Um, and it's just that idea of, you know, it's like we don't wait for the Spirit to come to us. We ignite the Spirit from within us and allow it to fill the room. And that's what these teens did. That's what this young man did. And it's kind of been a calling card of mine um, since then, which is going at probably 20 years now. Wow. I know when you uh, when you were out uh, for the New Thought Music Festival, you used that uh, as your opening number. Yeah. And it was uh, it was one of the great opening numbers, I think, of, you know, for the whole movement. Um, yeah, it's a rousing yeah. rock and. Yeah. You know, I've always heard it as that kind of delta, that the bam, bam, boom, bam, 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 you know, I just supposed to be down and greasy and big backbeat. <laughs> and uh, it's great when you get a lot of people singing on it and uh, um, people seem to respond to it. Um, but it's 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 once again, it's about conjuring the spirit in individuals, um, which I think is the nature of music. You know, when you go back to African tradition, the whole idea of stomping into the ground and stuff and the dirt raising up, it's about conjuring the spirit. And uh, we're just conjuring it from the inside out. That's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, I think that, I know that's what happens when I hear it in concert. It's, yeah. <laughs> so the next song we want to talk about is Something's Calling Me. Where, where did that one come from? Something's Calling Me has special significance because um, it, was, it was before my wife and I actually started dating. We had been friends, um, and we became prayer partners, which is how we really got together. And uh, we were in the middle of, I, you know, she had told me about this. Uh, she was doing a prayer partnership with Kathleen McNamara, who's been the head of the practitioner corps at Agape for years, she said, we're doing a 30-day prayer devotional. I'm like, what's that? She said, we call each other each morning and just hold each other in prayer. We just set our intentions and talk about what's going on. And I said, I want to do that. And I remember I was living over on Moore Park near Lancashire in a one-bedroom uh, apartment. Um, and I was sitting in the chair, and she was praying. It's like, stop, something's calling me. And I went and started to write that song. And then um, I couldn't find the bridge. And Ed Munter and I were at Susie's apartment and Sherman Oaks. And Susie's a classically trained pianist. My wife is a classically trained pianist. She's got her master's from piano performance from Carnegie Mellon and uh, grew up classical, did not understand uh, popular music and stuff like that. And she goes, well, you know, talking about the bridge, where does it want to go? And she said, well, 
I don't know why I'm saying this because I have no idea what it means. She goes, but something tells me it's supposed to be bluesy. And that's where I do the A minor um, up to that, uh, that C and then the D and then the E uh, sliding up the C7 to the D7 to E7. Um, and so it was interesting. Um, but it came out of a prayer with my then friend who became my girlfriend, who became my wife and the mother of my child and uh, master practitioner and author. And um, yeah, I love that song. Um, uh, in fact, this benefit that I'm doing um, that will be airing, I believe June 26th, I don't know if this will air before then, but um, uh, this benefit is for this camp at Cedar Ridge up in Vernonia, um, Oregon, that they're looking to purchase this land. And I'm like, I've got to do this song because this land is calling us as a greater movement, uh, as Centers for Spiritual Living, to leave a legacy to our teens and to also create our own space that will become uh, the new place that where we used to do a Silomar. We can't afford to buy a Silomar, but we've got this 32-acre plot that we can turn into something where we can meet on a yearly basis and do that event. I think it would be great for the legacy of our movement and new thought. and Because uh, no, Lord knows we've been kicked out of a lot of camps because we weren't Christian, mm -hmm. sw swear, and which is so sad. It's like, okay, that's the good Christian ethic because we're not Christian. <laughs> um, you're going to kick us out. So, Yeah, I've, I've seen that happen. I've experienced that myself. I yeah, know it's that. so sad. It's like, it I, what would Jesus do? Jesus would <laughs> all are welcome, you know? It doesn't matter. All are yeah. welcome. Yeah, our Jesus would. Yes. So let's let's hear something's calling me. Something's calling me. Something's calling me. Something's calling me A little bit deeper than I've ever been before Feel like I'm walking on marbles Can't steal the earth beneath my feet My head in the clouds, my naked legs left dangling I can feel my heart begin to pound And everybody said, something's calling me A little bit deeper than I've ever been before Something's calling me than I've ever been before Long dark night my soul in wonders Can't see the light that moves me If God is everything and everywhere that I belong Calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Something's calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Oh Lord.
calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Compassion's calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been Faith keeps calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Peace is calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. God is calling me. I'm grateful like I've never been before. Yeah, I, I think I agree with Susie. That's a nice bluesy thing that comes comes in with that uh, that bridge. bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Uh, when you say that, you are so open and vulnerable you know i mean that's uh um um feel like i'm walking on marbles mm. you know to, haven't you, i think we've all experienced that sort of loss of balance loss of center you know and of course that's when you need something like something to call you um i think that's what's been going on this last year with covid with the election with everything that's been going on i think a lot of people feel like they've been walking on marbles it's like they want to feel solid earth they want to feel and it's like and it's like instead of looking outside it's like i've got to find that within myself because the world's you know that it, it's going to shimmy and shake but it's like it's finding it within ourselves, within our stillness hmm. you know jamie um uh where did jamie lula come from you know i mean uh, for those of us who know you and maybe those of us uh, who don't know you um uh, who are maybe, you know, just discovering you through this uh, podcast. Um, uh, you know, can you tell something about the early days, the, the formative years of, uh, of yourself back in Detroit? I grew up on the, the northeast side of Detroit in the humble village of Roseville. Uh, I was born in Royal Oak. My father was a golf professional. He worked at country clubs. He was the head pro at country clubs. Um, I started doing music. I was walking down Kathy with uh, my best friend and, and another friend that we'd all started in school together in first grade, Ron Buchek and Michael Van Overbeck. And Michael had left after fourth grade. We met again in high school, and we've been best friends ever since. But he said, hey, you used to play bangos on, bongos on the desk, and I play drums and Ron plays guitars. Let's, let's, you know, let's start a band. This was in 10th grade. So we started playing, and I, we, you know, I think I was just talking about the other day. I think our first gig was my brother and my cousin Michael David and my cousin Cindy all had a joint graduation party. We were talking about it because I never had a graduation party, and we haven't, we're not having one for William just because of COVID. He's actually going to be going to Greece. But I started playing in bands, and we did cover songs, and we did Peter Frampton and and uh, the Rolling Stones and, and, and uh, Kiss and Todd Rundgren and, you know, just covered a lot of the 70s music uh, at that point. And uh, we started to write a couple songs. And I left that band, I was in that band from 15 until I was 19. And then I left that band and uh, was just trying to figure out what I want to do. I loved singing. Uh, I, I barely got through high school, um, have some learning challenges, but didn't, we didn't have all those labels back then. At 21, I went and did my first professional um, theater because I'd been doing a lot of musical theater um, in high school and then out of high school. And I started singing in a church in my early 20s in St. Clair Shores, Michigan, and I knew I wanted to sing. Uh, I got into a band uh, called The Lifters, back in Detroit. We were together from probably 82 until about 85. 
I'm kind of curious if you had uh, the musical theater thing. I'm wondering if you had any favorite roles or favorite shows or anything that uh... I played Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ Superstar. Mm. I loved that musical. Uh, I loved um, Jesus Christ Superstar. I, and I loved I ended up playing Jesus a couple times uh, in a couple different productions. Um, but then I, I, I kind of lost a, a taste, you know, because I wanted to be a rock and roller. And it's like, you know, uh, in musical theater. Um, I loved Hamilton. We listened to it so much when my son was in middle school. Um, I'm excited to see In the Heights here coming up soon. The bottom line, what I fell back in love with was the storytelling. And what I miss about doing musical theater is the same thing that I missed when I went out as a solo artist and left my band because I just didn't have to deal with anybody's caca, you know. I could just, I just had to deal with my own neurosis. I missed working with other people. And that's why, you know, I've been writing with Gary Lynn Floyd for the last eight years. We've written over 30 songs in lockdown. Uh, and I love the collaborative process. I actually just talked to my bass player this morning. Um, and we're going to try and put something together to just do some kind of Nolan stuff. But we're going to take and... He said, let's just get together and see how it flows. I'm like, cool, because I haven't done cover music in a long time. I've just been working on writing. Out of the lifters, you know, I left them after a while, and uh, I eventually made my way out to Los Angeles to go to the Musicians Institute. I was in a band called Lula. Uh, we were originally called Anything Orange, but then we were called Lula. And in 98, when I started my master's at University of Santa Monica, in spiritual psychology, I decided I didn't want to go and sing in bars anymore. I, it just didn't, no longer, I'd been sober for a number of years at that point, and it just didn't resonate with me any longer, and I wanted to do this music. I started going to Agape in 94, about nine months after my, my dad made his transition, and I just said I want to devote myself to writing music of consciousness and I heard a lot of the music, and it's like it just felt like platitudes. I said I wanted to go deeper. Something's Calling Me was an early song, Light of the World. And a lot of it came out of the teen camps because I was writing for the teens. Um, but there seems to be a really broad spectrum of uh, demographic of people that, that like it. And so since 19, probably 1995, I've been writing more music uh, of consciousness in this new thought. And having grown up Catholic and God's out there and then getting into this teaching and realizing that that infinite presence is within me and within all of us, I wanted to, I wanted to share that with people without proselytizing, without being dogmatic. And our way is the only way. It's like it's not. It's like find the way that works for you and celebrate life, celebrate God, worship in a way that works for you and suspend judgment of everybody else. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, maybe after that, we'll, we'll let, we'll let it sit, uh, and simmer with us. Let's play the next song, which is uh, also off that, uh, that something's calling me album. Your, your, was that your first, uh, new thought album? Yes. Yes. Okay. I originally did a three song EP that I raised money for that record. And, uh, I started recording it with Rob Whiteside's woo. I think I did the three songs with Rob, and then I went on and did the album, and Ben Dowling produced Something's Calling Me. That's the first full-length solo record that I did, and it was released 17 days before my son was born, and he just turned 19, so that record is 19 years old. Well, it stands. It stands well. Thank you. Uh, Thank that's you, That's wonderful work. So this is from that, uh, the last selection we've got from that, and it's uh, I Won't Waste. <laughs> I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste one more minute of my life. I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste one more minute of my life. Every step I take With every 
heart beat And every breath I breathe I'm grateful It's sacred, it's so beautiful I feel your precious presence as in my life Now I won't waste, I won't waste I won't waste, I won't waste I won't waste one more minute of my life I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste one more minute of my life. Every conversation is an opportunity to see the light of love shine. Divinity, it's sacred, so beautiful. I feel your precious presence as my life. Now I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste one more minute of my life. I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste, I won't waste. I won't waste one more minute of my life Oh yeah Now Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on I have so much more to be grateful than to be sorry for I have so much more to be grateful than to be sorry for of my life I won't waste 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 one more minute of my life I won't waste one more minute of my life I won't waste one more minute of my life It's such a great message for all of us, you know. Did you, uh, was there something uh, about it for you in particular? Did you feel like some time had been wasted or, or was it just uh, an admonition in general? I wrote that I was, uh, I was doing music for Kelly Morgan's Artist Sway class at the Bodhi Tree and I came home and wrote that. But um, I think there was a sense, you know, I started drinking and using in my early teens after swearing it off. And, and it's like, you know, I grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was an alcoholic. He was a functional alcoholic. Um, and there was a lot of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and sexual abuse on both sides, just going back to my grandparents. And I just got caught up in that that whirlwind and especially in the 70s and 80s it's like sex drugs and rock and roll that was like you know that was mecca um until like i say until i realized i wanted to do music of consciousness spiritual however you want to frame it um and i think that i felt like i i realized today that everything has fed into who i am today and uh, I can't, I can't lose any of it. So how can I use it? And I don't have to negate it because it served. And you know, I wanted to be a minister for a really long time. And I thought because of you know my alcoholism and my drug abuse and sexual abuse, all that different stuff. It's like, well, I I can't do this until I realized these are the things people don't want to hear. Someone coming from I'm I'm levitating. It's like they want to hear people that are grounded. 
And, uh, and I also realized that music is my ministry. And I don't need any more letters before or after my name to live that ministry. So that's my charge. And I love this song, too. It's like that bridge. I have so much more to be grateful than to be sorry for. And it's like that sometimes just becomes a mantra during a concert. I'll just get people just sing this. And it's like when you're feeling like you're not enough, like you're failing, it's just go back to that. I have so much. I have so much more to be grateful than to be sorry for. I have so much more to be grateful than to be sorry for. Just keep singing it because a prayer sung is twice prayed. And when you begin seeing that, it's like it's like you you raise your vibration. You know? Find that mantra and sing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. Whatever works for you. Yes, exactly. The next song that I, I want you to speak to is um, I think it's a quintessential shower song sing along in the car song well anywhere <laughs> but uh yeah and and i i just i just adore this song there's a healing going on oh yeah i i started this at ricky byer's house at a tag rehearsal tag was the agape group and it was started by carl anderson and we had been talking about writing some songs and she she ricky said well what, what do you got jamie what do you got jamie lula and i started saying my brother 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 my and got some guys to sing that and then i started saying my mother my my, my mother my sister my brother my friend my mother my sister my brother my friend my brother my sister and and father mother father god there's a healing going on and it's like it didn't work for her <laughs> And it didn't work for tag, but I just kept working on it because it's kind of going back to all of the things that I've experienced in my life. The healing was the recognition that it serves my life and it can serve other people. And uh, man, I have sung that song so many times on my Alive record, which has got the photo of my son when he's about a year old on on the front cover. It was a live concert at Jim Terrell's church. And Joe Pusateri was playing drums, and Martin Lund was playing saxophone. Rob McDonald was playing bass and singing. Uh, Tommy Reeves was playing keyboards, and I think David Neal was playing guitar. And it's like we barely rehearsed it, but we turned it into this 11-minute version where they started playing music to it. It wasn't just a cappella and, you know, saxophone, piano, guitar, bass solo. And, and I, you know, I've heard Greg Stamper and his group out of Brooklyn do a version of it. It's And it's absolutely my favorite version of it. They just kill it. He's got like a nine-person choir, and he begins testifying, you know, towards the end of it. And they, they, they keep, the, the choir behind him keeps singing, Oh, you rock my soul. And he just keeps singing over it. It's so cool. I, you know, I was nominated for a posse for that song. And uh, my friend Marcy Baruch actually won. It was for healing. It was the healing category. And that song didn't win. But I remember being there after I sang it. And Harold Payne was uh, at the Posse's. We were in Florida. And he came up to me afterwards. And I had just started weeping after singing it because I just did it straight a cappella. And he came up to me and he put his hand on my shoulder. I was sitting there kind of sobbing. And he said, Brother Carl would be so proud of you right now. And he's here. I feel him. And I was like, oh, man, it touched me. Because Carl Anderson was became a really close friend and uh, just another person that went way too, too young. Hmm. Well, let's, let's give that one a listen. There's a healing going on by oh, Jamie Luna. Oh, oh, oh. Let me walk to the banks of the river of love Where the current runs deep and baptized in the one Where there's no separation and the light is all we see Honoring all our differences and love will set us free Whoa, 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 mother, father, God 
There's a healing going on Mother, Father, God There's a healing going on Yeah, Mother, Father, God There's a healing going on I said, oh, you rock my soul I said, oh, you rock my soul I see the blessings of the past it's time to requalify. Let's not forget, but learn to forgive. God knows we gotta try. It's my responsibility to heal the wounds in me. Compassion, faith, and hope, and love, and truth will set us free. Oh, oh, Mother, Father, God, there's a healing going on. Mother, Father, God, there's a healing. There's a healing going on. I said, Oh, you rock my soul. I said, Oh, you rock my soul. One more time, I said, Mother, Father, God. There's a healing going on. Mother, Father, God. There's a healing going on. Mother, Father, God. The healing going on. I said, Oh, you rock my soul. I said, Oh, you rock my soul. I said, Oh, you rock my soul. My brother, 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 my brother. My mother, my sister, my brother, my friend, my brother, my sister, my mother, my friend, my brother, my sister, my mother, my friend, my brother, my sister, my mother, my friend. Oh Lord, yeah. There's a healing going on. Come on, y'all. There's a healing going on. There's a healing going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a healing going on. Can you feel it? Yeah. There's a healing going on. Sing some healing for me, Mr. Rob. There's a healing going on. Yeah. There's a healing going on. There's a healing going on. There's a healing
the saxophone. There's a healing going on. Come on, Tommy, sing it with me. There's a healing going on. Come on, Rob. There's a healing going on. 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 So awesome. Uh, I just got an email from Reverend Chris Collins, who does what some have called the Rebel Asilomar. It's a very tiny, intimate. And she said she'd reached out to you, but hasn't yep. heard back yet. So I certainly have my fingers crossed that you'll be back to Asilomar this year and well, be August 1st. I just got the email. Um, I just got the email today that they were going back. I didn't get an email saying, hey, are you going to come? <laughs> But um, I think that's a given, Julie. Yeah, <laughs> but I love Chris Collins. I love Asilomar. Uh, I love the Rebel Asilomar. And um, I'm slated to go back to my second mother's memorial. Uh, Michael Van Overbeck, who I was talking about earlier, his mother was like our second Meyer mother growing up. Stuff that I couldn't talk to my mom about, I'd go to her. And her memorial is, um, is actually July 28th, which is the day after the ninth anniversary of my brother's passing. Mm. And um, so I'm trying to figure it out because I'm planning on driving back to Michigan. But if I do that, I'm going to have to go to Michigan even earlier and then drive from Detroit back to uh, Monterey directly and not go to LA. But I, I want to be there because it's just, it's just such a fabulous location. And, um, and I hope I, I'm trusting that we're going to get this land up in Oregon and that we're going to create that same tradition um, there. But I hope that Chris keeps doing her thing because hers is so sweet. It's all in one room. Mm -hmm. And Anton and, and his partner, Laura. Laura. Uh, man, we had such a great time oh, when I did it last it was, time. It was so fun. And, and yeah. your workshop was amazing. And I sang better than I ever had before just because I, I was given permission. Yeah. So not that my voice was great, but just to, to play with the harmonies that I think yes. that's what you were teaching us in the workshop. I but, love doing those vocal yeah. workshops. And yeah. I think it's so, so important for the community to, to, you know, people think, well, I can't sing. And I grew up in the Catholic church where everybody just sang the melody and it was <laughs> straight. And it's like my mother came from the Methodist tradition and all her brothers and sisters used to sing together and they would harmonize. So I grew up learning harmony. So we'd sing harmony in the Catholic church and people would kind of turn and look at you like, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm singing harmony, you know, cause I can't just keep singing what y'all are singing. It's like them singing the Lord's prayer. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be, you know, however they were singing the Lord's uh -huh. prayer at that uh -huh. time. Uh -huh. And it just, it didn't, there was no heart and soul about it. That's why I've always loved, um, you know, gospel churches and, and Baptist churches and so, sought them out in Detroit, sought them out in, in um, uh, Dallas when I lived there. And that's why I love Agape so much, because there's such an eclectic array of music and uh, you're not just getting the same thing all the time. If you had to guess, how many times have you performed at Agape? How many times have I performed at Agape? Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, I know it's probably... Uh, you know, it's, it's hundreds of times I've been there for, uh, I have been there since 94 and I started singing there probably in like August of 90. If I stuck around cause I, I had been in a Christian fellowship that I got involved with the music ministry and then the first Gulf war happened and they started preaching end times and revelations. And if you don't get Jesus, you're going to hell. And I'm like, I'm out of here. So when I got to agape, I loved what Michael was saying, but I was very cautious because I was afraid they're going to like, you know, pass the Kool-Aid and say, okay, well, we're right and everybody else is wrong. <laughs> and that never happened. So I decided to audition for Ricky Byers and I played one of my songs. Uh, it's called, it's, I, I, and I think that it's on the live, a live record, but it's called In My Prayer to You. And she goes, well, that's a really nice song. Do you have anything else? And I really didn't have that much. So I just did an acapella version of Amazing Grace and um, she went over to the keyboard and started playing. 
um, later in the song. And then on that following Sunday, I was sitting next to my L.A. mother, Joan Rutherford, and Ricky came up before me. That was back when we were on, in Santa Monica. And she tapped me on the shoulder. She said, our morning song person didn't show up this morning. Would you be willing to get up and sing Amazing Grace the way you did for me on Friday? And I was like, okay. And I got up and and because um, they used to have a, a, a morning song singer who sang the first song and then a featured singer that would sing a couple songs. And I sang Amazing Grace. And... I, you know, I sung in bands and bars and concerts and stuff like that. And people responded, like leapt to their feet and kind of lost their mind. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know what to do with it. I was like so overwhelmed and so like, uh, you're doing this for me. <laughs> and Reverend Michael came over and gave me a hug. She says, Ricky was telling me about me. Ricky was telling me about you. <laughs> so, yeah, I've it's been hundreds of times because I participated in their their uh their music symposiums and uh revelations and yeah it's 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 been hunting and i just led chants there a couple weeks ago yeah. but i love it I, I love my community i love the agape community i love the music i love the message um i love michael i mean you know michael and my wife are really close uh he's he and ricky are godparents to to my son he's got a, actually got a god family but it's a great community. It's a tremendous, I'm so blessed and honored to be part of it and to have been part of the music team for so long. Well, I'm sure that's a blessing that works both ways. I am absolutely sure of that. Yes. Let's, uh, let's listen to another one of your pieces. One of my personal favorites. It's there's, there, there's a healing going on was, um, uh, was on that live album, but then you named your next album after it. Yes. If I'm, if I'm correct. Yes. And this is off that it's, uh, uh, compassion. Grateful for your tenderness Life can feel unkind Grateful for the way you see When I'm stuck inside my mind Grateful for your courage To hold your steady ground Grateful for compassion When man cannot be found Oh, compassion when broken heart Emptiness abounds Grateful when you take my hand And you turn my head around Grateful for the healing And warmth of your embrace I'm grateful for compassion To touch a deeper
song about being uh open and vulnerable mm-hmm. you know th- this is uh uh this is a theme i'm detecting you know, do, do yeah. i have that right yeah i you know after something's calling me came out um i had done 48 weekends that i went and sang at different places uh with something's calling me and uh, a lot of it was just going out on sunday but a lot of it was traveling around the country and I said to my wife, it's like, I can't just keep going out every Sunday and doing this because I was teaching at Musicians Institute at the time as well as going out on weekends and sometimes doing more extended tours. So I decided to go back into um, the prayer room where my wife saw clients. We were living in the lower flat of Cynthia James over on South Orange, which is my favorite color. Too. So I'd go back there three times a week. And I would do I do some yoga and some stretching. Then I'd go into meditation, and I would be led to what I was going to do to write that day. And um, I was start. I brought in journals. I would sometimes go to the piano, sometimes pick up the guitar, sometimes just work on an existing song. And I had a journal from when I did my um, um, practicum for University of Santa Monica out in uh, Palm Springs in 2000. And um, and there were notes in it because my wife and Cynthia James both graduated from University of Santa Monica, and they talked about the ecstatic experience that they had had at this practicum. And when I was there, it's part of the stuff that I've continued to work out in my life, but when I was there, I was not having that. I was beating the shit out of myself, excuse my French, <laughs> because I was not having an ecstatic experience. I was still in judgment. And, and so I found this lyrical idea, and I just I, I went with it um, because that's probably been one of the biggest struggles in my life is loving myself, is seeing myself, is accepting myself, um, Interestingly enough, during COVID, you know, I um, I started this program, Noom, not to promote any weight loss things, but um, I weighed in at 222 pounds, 222 and a half pounds in February. Yesterday, I weighed in at 207.8 or something, but it doesn't matter because I took some pictures of myself in the mirror out in my studio of my belly. I've never been able to just love myself where I am. And part of what I'm recognizing in the context of this is I just have to love myself exactly where I am, looking at myself and honoring myself, giving thanks for what I have and and just cherishing this this body temple that allows me to move through this um, existence. And because, I mean, for years I would, I re, I would look at pictures and I remember during those photographs that were taken of me feeling like I didn't like myself, I didn't love myself, I, I didn't think I was handsome. And then I'd look back five or ten years later, I'm like, 
why did I feel that way? I was a really handsome man. And then I keep, you know, I keep like waiting to become handsome or something. So my goal weight is 185 pounds, but it's like, I need to love myself at 222.5, 210, whatever the weight is. I need to just love myself right where I am. And that's where the compassion comes in because compassion and one of the line is compassion is where my spirit breathes. When I can find compassion for myself, I can find compassion for you. And hence, that's the thread through all of the music. You'll hopefully be able to find compassion for yourself because when, you can, when I can find it for myself, I can find it for you. Well, and I think that's a really good lead in to uh, the next song we want to talk about. Perfect. Mm. Would you like to talk about that before we, we listen to it? Sure. Because I'll cry when I, when I play it. <laughs> you know, this song was started at uh, up in Portland. I was up there to do David Alexander's, I think, installation into New Thought Center for Spiritual Living. I was at... I'm going to draw a blank on her name right now. I was at one of the minister's house, staying at her house. And I woke up with it. It's partly inspired by the movie Love Actually. Hmm. And uh, there's a scene in there. And the guy suggests that this woman is perfect. And another part of it, you know, a lot of people say, oh, did you write that for your wife? And it's like, yeah, I'd like to say that. But the truth of the matter is, as I sing it for my wife, it's my ringtone for my wife whenever she calls in. But I love this song because it goes back to that idea. It's like I didn't feel perfect most of my life. And it's an homage to people that I've loved as well as to God mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. essentially to the God that I witness in others. Mm -hmm. I always loved my teens. And there were a couple that I just had such an affinity for. I can't stop the muse. You know, I can't stop. You can't stop. I mean, you know, Al, I mean, as a writer, it's like, you know, it's like, OK, it's like if I have a feeling for someone, it's like I don't have to act on it, but I can use it and I can channel it into music. And that's kind of where it came from. It was inspired by a by a, um, a teen and I honor her. She's like now married and and it was also inspired by Kira Knightley in Love Actually. And it's like. If I can see that in others, why can't I see that in myself? And that reflection mm -hmm. of your ice, your reflection of the perfection that I'm witnessing in you is the perfection that resides within me. And I have to take ownership of it, like I was talking about with compassion. Mm -hmm. I have to take ownership of that. What I see in you is but a reflection of me. And I fought that for so long. And I know none of the people watching this will identify with that because <laughs> no. you're all levitating and you all love yourselves unconditionally. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's listen to Perfect. In my eyes, in my mind, in my heart, in my soul, in my life, I have been searching for something, but you are my dream. You're perfect, you're golden, your light, your love, you're perfect. You're golden, you're my light, my love. When I breathe, when I swallow, caress I feel. When I listen, I hear. The most beautiful music out of nowhere. Oh, you're perfect. You're golden. You're like your love. You're perfect. You're golden. 
You're my light, my love. You're always there. You never leave. You're holding me. You set me free. A guiding light. You're everywhere. Expressing and bend me. Oh, you're perfect. You're golden. You're the light of my life. You're my love from forever. In your reflection, I'm perfect. So I'll keep looking at you. I keep a witness saying that I'm perfect. I'm golden. You're the light of my life. You're my love from forever. In your reflection, I'm perfect. So I'll keep looking at you. To keep a witness saying my perfection. got that uh that gorgeous um that three that lilting that uh uh i don't know if that was a conscious choice on on your part when you're songwriting but it you know it puts you in a place it's got that that sort of that celtic ballad anglo-saxon ballad thing yeah um and then uh, of course uh you know uh your vocals are in, impeccable um uh, and then setting the, uh, the, there's just, is that a string quartet that I hear in that recording? Yes. Yes. Uh, it was, did you do um, that um, yeah, it was a brother and sister and, uh, Chris Woods and Adrian Woods who she's, man, she's played, I, I've seen her on so many Grammys and Oscars and whatnot. She played cello on it. He played first, second violin and viola on it. But Christian Klikovitz, who was the music director on that project, uh, wrote the um, the quartet. He wrote the uh, uh, arrangement, the string arrangement for that. Well, so to use all those English influences and add the string quartet, I mean, that's it's very Beatles ish, you know. Yes. In a, you know. Yeah, the oohs wonderful. and the ahs. That was a thing about the backgrounds that I, you know, it's not something that, you know, people think they can just come in and sing. It's like it really, there's a lot of subtleties that go, um, you know, yeah, ooh, ah, you know, it's like the, the Beatles did that. They would switch from oohs to ah or ah to ooh. And just those little subtleties, I'm sure that it was a George Martin influence. Sure. And, the, and, yeah. and as you know, that, when, you know, when you open, when you open from that ooh to the ah, and, and the, you can hear the overtones change in your, yes. in your head, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I love the, it, I love the Beatles. I love the, um, all that they did vocally. Um, but another favorite, like background vocals were the Iries that sang with the, uh, with Bob Marley, like those backing vocals are like, Oh man, I, I, I've studied them. Cause I just, I love those elements. And so it's like, yeah, when I get backup singers, it's like, yeah, we really need to work this because it's not just, it's not one, you know, it's just not triads. It's like, there's a little bit more going on, you know? 
let's move ahead. Let's get let's get a little more contemporary now. Let's move up to the Orange album. Love you the know? Orange albums. <laughs> it's you it's know, my white orange, album. Orange. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> You know, I think I think everything we've we've played for our audience, your fans will recognize, you know, because mm -hmm. these have been your your big hits and for good reason. They're all wonderful pieces. Uh, but I picked uh, something I think is uh, maybe a deep catalog, you know, something that uh, maybe maybe not so much, but it, it really uh, struck a chord with me. And it's this it's this darling little tune that you wrote. I love you, but we've never met. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's a co-write with Tom Kimmel, who's like one of my favorite writers on the planet, favorite human beings on the planet. Uh, we wrote that when we were at the Posse's. Um, we got there a couple, got, got there like a day early and they, we had some writing sessions. And Tom and I wrote that. And uh, still more Beatles influence in, in that quarterly and stuff. Um, but yeah, I just, you know, Tom and I were talking be, he's similar in that he accepts the muse when it shows up, you know, beautiful woman, beautiful scenery, whatever's going on. Um, he's able to witness it. And that's like, it's like, you ever had, you know, that idea of like, you know, it's, I, I love you, but we've never met that person that you've, you've kind of dreamed about or you visioned for or whatever. And uh, yeah, I loved I loved the writing session, and then we both continued working on it, probably for a couple months after uh, um, after the posies, just tweaking because there's you know he's like he's he's a Nashville writer, so it's like he'll you know like a lot of Broadway people, it's like he will work on the, now that lyric that lyric, and and it taught me a lot. You know that's what Floyd and I do. It's like we'll write a song and then you know have it and start going and it's like oh no but let's try this word oh yeah that's perfect that's you know just looking for the right word and the right melody and um i really hear that song i'd really love to do that as a duet at one point too i'd love to hear a woman's voice with that i think it would be really beautiful i love that song though thank you for bringing that forward now. let's uh let's let our audience hear it Oh, I love you, but we've never met We're as close as we can get I can feel you in my heart So we're never far apart See, I made up my mind And I think about you all you're a dream I can't forget Oh, I love you, but we If I saw you in the crowd today Would I recognize your face If you were singing on the street Would I lend a heart if we made up a song Would the world sing and dance along Like some Hollywood vignette Oh, I love you, but When I find you, will you know Tell me you've been waiting for your heart to give you a sign. Oh, I love you, but we've never met. We're as close as we can get. Cause I feel you in my So I'm never quite alone Hey, this song is for you And I promise you my aim is true I swear I'll find you yet Oh, I love you, but we never
love you, but we've never met. We're as close as we can get. 'Cause I feel you in my bones, so I'm never quite alone. Hey, this song is for you, and I promise you my aim is true. I swear I'll find you yet. Oh, I love you, but we never. Yeah, that is that that is just a wonderful piece, and it's it, and like perfect, you know, it's one of those that could be from a, a person to their lover or a person to their unknown lover. Right, uh, person, uh, you know, or it could be, it could there be, could be some divine, yes, uh, you know, kind of aspect to it, and I think that's brilliant songwriting where you leave mm -hmm. it open, so it might, it could be different for different people or different for the same person at a different time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the beautiful things for me, as an artist. You know, Michael Beckwith's quote on my website states that it's like, I never sing the song twice, the same twice. And for a lot of people that, you know, it irritates them because they want to, it's like, but my intention is always to come from where I am in the moment. I can't replicate where I was when I wrote the song. I can't replicate where I was when I wrote, there's a healing going on, but everything that's been going on in this last, you know, two years, and the COVID and everything, it's like, man, I've sung it. When my brother was, was dying of cancer, um, I sang it for him. You know, he, it took 57 days from when he found out that he was sick until he passed. And then I went, I flew from his memorial and went to Denver to sing at Mile High and had to sing that song um, just after he passed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I've sung it from so many different places. When George Floyd was killed. It's like I had I sang it from a different place. And the same with this song and the same with with so many I I I don't just, you know, some people I had a guitar player who was a great guitar player, but he would play the same he would work on a solo and they were beautiful solos, but he would never stray from what he had created, which I honor, but it's not it's not how I'm built. I have to go from where I am and I'm sure that you understand that. Exactly, exactly. Let's move to um, another uh, of your songs that has some of these same qualities. It's been recorded a few different times. And I, I'm guessing that's because of what you were just talking about, because at different times, it, you know, there are different approaches that resonate with you. Um, that's uh, Love is My Religion. Mm. You know, it's kind of maybe the ultimate affirmation. Mm. It's, I love that song. I love the Ziggy Marley song. I was actually at a teen retreat in Colorado between Christmas and New Year's. And um, I'd been writing a lot while I was there. And I, I'd come home um, to L.A. after this, and I played these two different song ideas for my wife. And my wife looked at me and said, yeah, I think that's the same song. <laughs> and I don't even know, we realize like, you know, what, so um, that song was initially inspired um, by this teen camp and all they talked about. Um, um, Ziggy Marley's version is more, feels more like a romantic love kind of thing, especially the video. I'm sure that there's deeper meaning for him and stuff. But, you know, I wish you peace. I wish you joy. Um that going from wishing to love is my religion, um, love is my voice, love is my choice, um, love is my decision, um, love is my religion. Um, I, you know, it so resonates. And once again, this last 15 months, it's come up a lot. 
came a lot in COVID, came all up with all the Black Lives Matter, came up around the election, came, I've sung it a number of times in a number of different ways. Uh, I did a version of it with Christian Klikovitz, who, who was the music director on There's a Healing Going On, and we just did piano and voice. Um, I don't know if you've heard, you've heard that version, yeah. Al? Yeah. Yeah. I love that version. It's so intimate, and, and um, a lot of times with production, it's like I think that I'm pretty articulate when I sing, but sometimes when you break it down and you hear it like in such an intimate, just piano and voice, um, it brings out something completely different. And I, yeah, I love the, uh, I'm grateful that this music has moved through me, that I get to get out of the way and get it down, that I'm courageous and that I've been courageous enough to wake up no matter what time it is to bring it down and to take it to the nth degree to bring it to the level um, that I hope communicates and conveys and, uh, heals and uplifts and open hearts and inspires individuals to their greatest next yet to be. Well, let's listen to Love is My Religion. I wish you peace. I wish you joy. I wish you love, love. Love, 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 I wish you faith in yourself to reveal all that you've come here to be. Love is my choice. Love is my decision. Love is my voice. Love is my religion Love is my religion I wish you strength I wish you courage Wish you love, 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 love I wish you purpose to create all your dreams and to conspire with the light of your life. Love is my choice. Love is my decision. Love is Love is my religion Oh, love is 
Yeah, it's hard for me to pick a favorite Jamie Lula song. You know, it's it's maybe it's just the last or the one I'm hearing at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Al. There's a lot of guitars on that particular recording that we just heard that uh, uh, did you play all those or did you have? No, some that, help? I, you know, I wanted to mention it because Gordy Germain produced the Orange album and he was my guitar player in the band Lula. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons why we did a piano, ver piano guitar or piano voice version of it, because Christian said, how can I compete with all these guitars? But G Gordy, Gordy just started recording maybe I don't know, uh, eight years ago, he built a man cave and started, you know, he's a, he does props and he's played guitar for years, but he said, you know what, I'm going to start doing this. And he, since he, he, we took about six years to record that record because he had just started out recording and said, come on, I need a guinea pig. So I went to a studio and we, we just kept recording and recording and he kept doing mixes and mixes until we finally got to a point where he felt confident but he he played the the, uh, the electric guitars, and I loved it because he was looking for a sonic element. Uh, it wasn't just playing chords. He you know he used a lot of reverbs and and delays and stuff on it that were really beautiful. And 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 Gordy is is untrained from the perspective that he's not schooled. He doesn't read or write, but it's like he's he's intuitive and he's great at musical hooks. Um, and I, I, I loved the production that he did on the Orange album. And, um, and I loved all the guitar parts. And I was like, okay, Christian, I understand <laughs> you'll get swallowed up by the guitars. But I loved the guitar wash that he created. There was almost a um, Daniel Lanois. Oh, he did a, it. He kind of did yeah. that kind of guitar wash uh, with that song, which is, I don't know, it's, it's moving to me. It help, helps move the song and it helps convey um the feeling of the song as well yeah just just gorgeous just gorgeous so this may be uh, a little bit of a trick question i don't know we've played a lot of your music uh and you know and a lot of it's got great messages is there something of yours that uh maybe is a personal favorite or that you think we missed or that might just you know uh that we should add to our to our lineup here is there if we're sp strictly speaking of my music, I think you guys covered quite a few bases. I, I, you know, from the Orange album, I love, um, I love better than I was before, and oh my God, I think I also on on on. There's a healing going on. Uh, uh, if you could see me um, through your eyes. Also, you know, I I started writing with Gary Lynn Floyd eight years ago. We just celebrated eight years of writing together. And the first song that we wrote, uh, it's not strictly a Jamie Lula song, but I, I'm as proud of it, if not more so than so much of what I've written. The first song we wrote together was God in Everyone. Mm. Man, I, you know, we, just, we just took off from there. I mean, we've got quite a body of work prior to um, the, the uh, pandemic, but we've written, you know, I, I want to say 30 songs, and then we found a bunch of, of music that we'd been working on some of the stuff that we'd actually finished but we 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 never played it you know because <laughs> we you know we live in different locations we don't play together so much um but god and everyone i think is um i know it's a floyd lula song but man i just you know we played that for some people in my living room in november of 2019 we did a little gathering i wanted to get some people together and my friend John Lynn, who worked for Hollywood Records and wrote some songs for Earth, Wind, and Fire and wrote with Allie Willis and who also contributed to The Color Purple. But we had John Lynn and, and Stephen Bray and Ben Dowling and Mitch Foreman. We just had some people over to listen to some of our music. And we played that song, and John, who's, who's a Brick, Brooklyn Jew, said, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I think that should be sung in every fucking temple and mosque <laughs> and church in the world, <laughs> you know, and just that Brooklyn Jew attitude. I loved it. I love the song. I think it speaks to the the universal spirit and it's not dogmatic and it's recognizing that the, that infinite spirit of God is within all of us and it's our charge to recognize it, to wake up to it, 
and to witness it in one another. Wonderful. Well, uh, um, I think Jeannie has a last word, and then we'll close out the show with, uh, with God and everyone. We uh, have talked about some of the things that are coming up for you, including the CSL, uh, I think, what are they calling it? The Concert Palooza or something? Yeah, Campa Palooza. It's for the Cedar Ridge right. Retreat Center so in we'll, Vernonia, Oregon. So with that, let's uh, hear the, uh, thank you so much for being here, Jamie. I know we've had some issues with technology and, uh, and you've been so patient and kind and we really appreciate that. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, Al. Bless your hearts. Thank you for doing this and bringing a greater awareness to New Thought Music. And thank you for the wonderful questions and for the opportunity for me to just like chat a bit about the music. I'm always <laughs> grateful for the opportunity. Bless you and, and bless Robert and the New Thought Network um, thank you so for much. putting this out to the world. Thank you. All right.
darkness I have come I see God in every 